series entitled Towards a Neuroecology of the Environment in the Age of COVID. My name is Chris Moon. I'm a professor of architecture and I focus on neuroscience and architecture. And I'm affiliated with ANFA, the Academy of Neuroscience for Architecture in San Diego. I will be moderating today's session with Neil Leach and I'm very happy to announce our guest today. We have David Kirsch, who is a cognitive scientist focusing on embodied cognition, and he's a professor at UCSD, as well as the president-elect of ANFA. Sean Alquist, an associate professor of architecture and director of the CNC Knitting Lab at the University of Michigan. His research seeks to engage in discussions of responsivity, sensory feedback, and human behavior to address the underrepresented populations often ill-affected by the complexity of our social and civic environments. And Pierre Kutlik, who is currently a PhD fellow at the Chair of Digital Architectonics Institute of Technology and Architecture at ETH. His current research focuses on the understanding of vision as a technology for architectural modeling. Our first session will begin with some presentations and then we'll move on to our discussions. So let me, I will start and let me start my sharing my screen. Thank you, Chris. Um, so I will be talking about neuropsychological properties of architectural space and um, primarily my concern is um, with these kind of questions. So architecture itself um, it, it faces the opportunity to answer some questions using COVID isolation, the concept of being isolated as a forcing function to identify some questions we can uh, address. I'm assuming a digital future, much as Chris has been talking about, but perhaps a little less ambitious, and then talking about how neuroscience can help. So with respect to the questions that COVID raises that architecture might address, here are some of the obvious elements um, that need to be addressed by architecture. And we find this as opportunity time, an opportune time to um, think about these in a new way. So. I've just collected a bunch of um, ideas from the literature, the notion of spatial confinement, everybody feels uh, being enclosed for long periods of time, often feeling trapped, especially those people who can't go out for a walk often. Uh, the space that they have feels inadequate. There's a reduced quantity and quality of social interaction, and primarily because uh, social interaction at a distance is not embodied, that is in a face-to-face -face manner, um, which I'll talk about, uh, the consequences of the social interaction we have are not as robust and powerful. Some people who live with others feel social claustrophobia. There's a feeling of reduced agency because there's less to do. We feel we have less power. There's less control over things. Naturally, there's a distribution of how people respond to all these things. Some people may feel these things acutely, others not at all. Um, the environment feels less rich because there's less novelty in our living situations and what we have we habituate to, which all results in a, in a diminished feeling of well-being, sense of well-being and often for many increased stress. So the kind of design assumptions I'm uh, assuming are not far off. In fact, I think they're completely present here and don't require uh, continuous quantitative and qualitative monitoring of humans to um, achieve. So these are things we could do right now. We can assume that we can digitally enhance um, architecture, certainly surfaces in a direct way using OLEDs. So we can manipulate the appearance. We could adaptively manipulate surface color, brightness, texture. Um, that would require some monitoring, but otherwise just uh, simple, simple measures could be picked up through data mining of activity. Uh, we'll assume ad adaptive acoustics, where the acoustics can be reshaped to um, uh, to define a different sized room and so on. We can assume digital displays, which I would think of as entry points. So in this scene, it constitutes a kind of entry point to a different semantic space than the one you're currently in. So we can puncture geometric spaces and bring in different socio-semantic spaces. And let's assume that we have very near future uh, ambient elements, dynamic surfaces, adaptive reconfigurations, and that is essentially the field of robotics. So how could neuroscientists possibly help architects solve these problems? Well, um, I'll talk very briefly about um, these, primarily three of these. 
The first is to exploit multimodal interaction. Humans are always embedded in environment and all their senses are active. We've been designed to be such. I will go into each one of these. Then we'll talk about neuromotivated control of illumination, sound or airflow, improving social interaction via robotics, and then a brief mention of quantified buildings. So here is how we can exploit multimodal interaction. This is the world we live in, if we're lucky, and uh, places where everything affects everything. And we have been designed to live in these places. Each of our senses has been evolutionarily designed to extract the maximum information in concert with the input from other modalities. For instance, it's been heard that when you crumple the package while eating, people think the chips are crispier, crunchier, fresher. So what we hear can change what we taste. And that's in part because mouthfeel is part of the taste experience. Here is a, um, there's neural connections between hearing and taste. So in some excellent work by Charles Spence, a high pitch noise such as this causes uh, this to taste, this particular chocolate to taste sweeter, whereas a low pitched noise biases the bitter taste. And you can, using the same taste stimulus, you can push it five to 10% in either direction, either making the same thing taste sweeter or the same thing taste more bitter. So that shows us that there's multimodal interaction uh, and at a surprisingly early phase in sensory processing. So it's modulated, each sense is modulated by the simultaneous attention to other senses. And information integration starts early. People have often talked about information integration, but the question was always whether early processing can affect early processing in other modalities. And the answer seems to be, the more we look, yes. Here's another case. That was in a closed room, small. That is exactly the same sounds, but now remodulated to uh, duplicate the sound that it would be in a large space, such as Santa Sofia in Istanbul. So the implication is that we can alter mental state in various sorts of ways. We can change the perceived size of things. We can make small rooms seem bigger by adaptively controlling acoustics so that the, the sound affects the perception of the size. We can change the room over time by manipulating cross-modal interactions. We can make the same chocolates sometimes feel taste sweeter. And we can do this in a variety of senses, obviously in ways to be carefully explored. And all these underlying factors can also affect mood and stress. Second point, we can scientifically control illumination, sound, and airflow. So in interior design, a standard belief principle is that vertical stripes make the walls seem taller. So here we have a little justification for this, uh, well, related to that. Anyway, imagine painting this uh, gray scale on a flat wall. There are no scaling cues to help you judge the depth and distance you are from the wall at all the different points on the wall. So I assume you would treat the wall as approximately equidistant bottom and top from where you are. Now you paint the wall with this texture, which provides uh, perspective cues, and the texture gradients now will bias your judgment of depth, where mid-range mid looks further away than up at the bottom because of that textural cue giving uh, perspective. The same when you put shapes on the wall. We have perspectival cues, and those can give the illusion of depth. All this seems very intuitive, but now we have can justify these things through neuroscientific study of exactly what affects what at what point. When you put the two together, the impact is even greater. So we can alter the sense of how deep a, a room is, just as we saw in the digital wall when we looked out into the garden or the forest before. It just makes the room feel quite different. Illumination also has an effect on mental focus, fatigue, strain, and stress. There's been an increasing amount of work on this now, where it's shown that brighter illumination does improve cognitive performance in school children, 
healthy adults and patients in early stages of dementia. And uh, other studies have shown that light modulates hippocampal function and spatial learning in rats. So the implication here is that we can alter judgment, performance, and subjective well-being. Now again, by illumination, texture, shading, we can change the feeling of what room we're in. We could alter on evidence-based methods perceptual properties so that we can improve human concentration, attention, other human performance measures. And again, we can alter underlying factors such as mood and stress in a systematic way. The third topic is social interaction. So in full-blooded social interaction, people are highly situated and they share the situated context. They share experience, they share emotions, they share valuation, they share sensory motor engagement of the space. And that requires being in the space co-located, at least initially we think, um, in order to get that shared. So I'd like to talk about my work, which um, certainly tries to touch upon um, some of the topics that uh, David has opened up, um, but looks at architecture a bit more specifically and tries to um, address the audience of individuals who have autism, um, other disabilities, and how um, environment is influential on in their behavior, maybe beyond what we might be able to understand. And, and I think also in a way that we aren't really privy to understand. So I think that's where there's kind of maybe an interesting discussion there in terms of the tools that um, David had laid out in terms of um, understanding responses between environment um, and, and somebody's uh, perception of it. Um, so, to be able to do this, I, I try to define architecture at the crossroads of, of these um, topics. Um, so my realm is, is in the area of developing material research, um, but also working um, very closely and collaborating um, with faculty and practitioners in the areas related to neurodiversity, behavioral science, um, education, um, as well as um, aspects of human behavior, psychology, um, things like this. <clears throat> so what I find is the challenge is this is kind of my world in which I have to navigate um, and able to, to be able to think about architecture. So moving through um, an understanding of structure, materiality from across a wide range of different scales, looking particularly at textiles, um, the machines that drive the fabrication of those materials, starting from the scale of a fiber being twisted into a yarn and then formed into stitches and textiles and so on, um, and the machines that um, bring that together in a three-dimensional form and how that becomes a structured um, surface, essentially what us architects might understand as an environment, creating an environment. What I think becomes challenging is this um, kind of precision, especially working in this area of sort of computational design and material research. The precision by which you have to act, I think becomes problematic because of the um, embedding of meaning that happens in that moment. Um, so the challenge is how can we work through this precision but be able to create architectures that can be so adaptive as to be able to transform their meaning um, and avoid some of those, um, what I think are, are really grand issues of dealing with, you know, the kind of architect's translation, the architect's assumption, um, and what is ultimately, I think, could be defined as bias um, about how space should be occupied, especially dealing with something related to autism, which has such a spectral range of, um, of how, uh, uh, you know, the symptomatology of, of each individual um, and how that individual would perceive environment and also how they can communicate um, how they perceive environment um, as well. So the idea is thinking about the textile as this medium um, in which to explore um, <clears throat> this idea. And if I can kind of borrow from um, an area of cybernetics, um, is what's called requisite variety. 
um, which is basically the idea to design a system that has so many variants to it that it has the ability um, to uh, form the necessary number of states so as to handle the various inputs. So the idea that someone may come to this environment with an unknown motivation for how it wants to be um, adapted, the environment has the requisite variety. It has the number of variables in form, tactility, space, organization, color, um, shape, uh, time, place, all these things. Um, it has the number of variables so as to be essentially um, repurposed. Um, I do want to mention a couple quotes that I think are relevant in this area. So the first from Tobin Siebers talking about um, disability theory. So disability creates theories of embodiment more complex than the ideology of ability allows. And these many embodiments are each crucial to the understanding of humanity and its variations, whether physical, mental, social, or historical. Constructions, which I think he's referring to both built, uh, physical constructions, as the architect might imagine, but also I think constructions of dialogue and social interaction. These are built with certain social bodies in mind, and when a different body appears, the lack of fit re reveals the ideology of ability that is controlling the space. I want to follow that up with a, a quote from Melanie Yergo, who is an um, autistic academic actually here in Michigan. We've constrained literacy and intellectual thought to a particular, particularized domain of symbols, to a particularized way of thinking, communicating, understanding, and arranging. And in doing this, constraining. And in doing this, we exclude. So the challenge for me is how do you act in, through these tools of precision, but be able to essentially embrace the unexpected um, and do so without a, a kind of, you know, a, a prediction of that um, able to happen. This is, is my daughter who has autism um, of particular importance. She's nonverbal. Um, so what I think becomes interesting is allowing that agency, that freedom um, for uh, a, a kind of meaning to emerge, um, what that, that means um, is that she can then use architecture as a tool for communication in instances where it becomes extremely unpredictable, <laughs> that architecture becomes a kind of fixation of oral exploration um, as opposed to the kind of scales of tactile exploration that you might um, imagine. So I think one thing that's important in this work and I think would be um, important this, in this discussion, um, this is kind of a, a, a key part to understanding the, the work that I've been doing and, and help guide it, um, is this understanding of kind of differential susceptibility. Um, so the idea is that we might define the neurotypical as the resilient individual and somebody with autism is being predisposed. So they may have issues with an environmental stimulus that would have, that would then cause negative outcomes. And often it's that quadrant, that bottom left quadrant that becomes of most concern because you're defining that individual by their deficiencies. I think that's the problem. And what we want to shift to is the top right corner and understand for somebody that might be predisposed, that actually means there's the potential for greater enhancement if you hit um, that positive stimulus. The problem is how do we know what that po positive stimulus is and will we ever know and should we ever know? I'll argue that I will never understand how my daughter um, conceives of environment. I, I literally will never understand, I know that, and I have to embrace that in order to let her freely discover and shape and communicate back to me what those meanings in time and space are. So what I think is starting to happen and or, or kind of a better understanding, and I think in this kind of age of COVID and isolation, I think is sort of starting to happen to everybody, is the resilient individual is shifting a little bit because of this discordance with environment. So because of this um, shifted understanding of what the meaning of the kind of forms and shapes and materials that architects often use to make and, and project those assumptions, those are very much changing. 
Now that's the world that somebody with autism that my daughter lives in, that me as a parent of somebody with autism lives in as well. <clears throat> So now this becomes a, maybe a more kind of universal understanding. And I think the other part to understand is there's really kind of different slices to the pie. So normally the architect may think about access, and I think that's more of a kind of neutral statement. Um, whereas again, we want to work in this top right corner where the kind of the, the environment is a triggering mechanism, is a, a kind of enhancing mechanism that allows for somebody who may in more normative conditions be isolated, it actually allows them to contribute. So the kind of last thing that I want to talk about is this is a, a phrase that I um, kind of uh, use as the sort of motto to the work to kind of wrap up a lot of talks that I do. Um, but in this context, I'd actually like to kind of pick it apart a little bit to help describe um, what I think are the kind of key parts to this idea of providing um, this kind of agency for unknown application. Um, so first is really thinking of the individual as, as a co-author. So obviously, you know, design has certain capabilities. An architect, a designer has certain capabilities that someone else will not. And I think it's still valuable to bring those novel ideas to the table. But I think there's also this authorship that has to be necessary in the transformation and, me and meaning, um, a sort of invoking of meaning within some of those novel ideas. The other thing that I think is really important is to think of this sort of sphere of life as a socio-material condition and to not lose focus by concentrating on the individual, even whether it's their deficiencies or whether they're their competencies. But in either case, that individual is, of course, a part of a social entity. So I am a part of my daughter's environment. I think just David was exactly talking about this with social interaction. It is very different to be the observer as opposed to the participant. And being the participant, of course, is going to change the outcome. And I am participant to my daughter's world. Um, <clears throat> maybe not in all moments she doesn't want me to be, but, but I am there. Um, and I think it's important to think of that network, which also includes the technologies as a part of her support. So this kind of like, you know, transmaterial human um, technological plane um, is really what defines that sort of sphere of life. And it's, and it's, I would argue it's not always centrally located um, on that individual. And if these two are possible, then the outcome, their abilities, again, become language, it becomes communication, it becomes our ability to learn something from them as opposed to us confirming that we know something about them. Um, and that these languages are going to come out in very indeterminate ways, very multimodal means, um, very novel ways that, that we may not immediately uh, understand. So just as an example of this, um, looking within one of our designs, one very small region, we see how there's been this kind of recasting of functions. So in the top image, looking at one child who's more um, interested in the kind of cutaneous exploration, the tactile, the fine scales of exploration within these environments. And what was interesting in his case is the teachers talked about not only his experience in the environment, but the next 30 minutes afterwards when he was in the classroom and showed clearly much more focus and ability to maintain attention over the span of you know 10 to 15 minutes as opposed to his usual four to five minutes. I think that kind of radiance of effect, I think is very interesting that this radiance of agency, I would argue, um, has the ability to overcome what be, might be the challenges of a more normative um, educational uh, situation. And then in the bottom, that same location within this same very small environment becomes an exploration of kinesthetic behavior. Um, so a kind of moment of building skills for uh, and practicing skills for movement, which for children with autism and other disabilities, if you don't learn these movement skills, well, you know, social uh, um, interaction, participation in, you know, uh, in physical activities with your friends, 
um, that falls by the wayside. If you don't learn, if you can't learn how to ride a bike, well, at one point, all your friends are going to have bikes and they're just going to ride off and, and leave you behind. So it's actually, um, it may just look like play, but these are actually critical development. So in wrapping up, I want to say that this, this sort of concept of connecting authorship, this sort of technological, material, human landscape, um, and the understanding of communication, what I think this does is this shifts the pro design process out of the realm of, or beyond the realm of the architect, and it is that engagement of others and otherly motivation as a part of that design process that becomes agency. And then therefore, if we talk about requisite variety again, maybe that becomes another one of the architect's tools to understand and maybe measure a degree of inclusivity of in, in, in their environment. Does it have that requisite variety of variability to adapt to this very neurodiverse population? So um, what I'm involved in, it's a certain kind of basic research, uh, which is balancing between both practical experiments and theoretical ones, where exploring various techniques inform underlying technologies and the ideas behind them. So that's kind of the general process. Okay, I'm gonna introduce now a few technical terms and, and keep it short just to, to explain uh, a few things about those different experiments. So as I mentioned, electric potentials, I'm employing uh, mostly uh, EEG, electroencephalography, which is uh, basically a way to include uh, a much broader range uh, of, uh, of people and, and cognitive condition in that sense that it is <clears throat> allowing you to uh, acquire, to record uh, residual uh, neural activity in the form of electric potentials from the top of the skull without having, uh, from the top of the scalp, sorry, without having to uh, go in an invasive fashion into the body. So that way you can also employ, um, uh, you, you can basically use participants which are not necessarily in the condition of handicap or in a clinical state uh, and, and therefore use a broader range of, uh, of uh, potential cognitive conditions, but also envision a potential broader range of applications that way. Now, most of my work, as I said, is, uh, well, all of my work is uh, involved into studying vision as a technology. And more precisely, it's uh, using uh, the idea of uh, the gaze and the attention push that someone puts into looking at something. So that helps also to define which kind of particular cognitive process or which kind of neural pattern is of interest to study. And all of that is implemented within uh, an information and communication uh, flow, uh, which is called uh, BCI, Brain Computer Interface, or more generally, a brain machine interface where you literally put into a flow of information a brain and a computer or a machine. Now, in terms of a broader range of applications, what I'm trying to do uh, for architectural modeling is, is uh, specifically trying to identify this and uh, experiment which kind of application would make sense by conveying uh, this kind of models. So I'm also using special kind of uh, visual presentation uh, as a stimulus, which are serial over time, to observe and study uh, neural responses to uh, such visual stimuli. Uh, so those neural responses are typically called event-related potentials. And uh, here they are for the study of uh, what is called visual discrimination. Uh, when you recognize a peculiar stimulus among other, which share a level of self-similarity. So coming back to the example of spelling words, if you show characters, different characters of the alphabet in a sequential way, uh, by implementing such interface, you might be able to discriminate some, one or some over others, and formulate words over time. 
So through the study of uh, those uh, various models and applications with brain computer interfaces, I'm trying to transfer and question also in the opposite direction which kind of concern and idea uh, architecture would be able to convey through that. Now, I think there are two corollaries uh, between modeling in the architectural sense and what kind of potentiality can be found in the understanding of vision as a technology. And those are, uh, in the case of this presentation, two typical examples which might be speaking more to an architectural audience because they are uh, uh, very iconic in the history of architecture. Nevertheless, I think they are meaningful to um, uh, to explain uh, those terms. So in regards to visual perception and higher levels of cognition, the idea of how optical information coming from a thing in the world out there is encoded to provide for indexation in relation to semantic categories of a higher uh, level may produce meaningful representation in the brain. Uh, and as a corollary for uh, architectural modeling, there are two things which are foundational to this idea, which is about dealing with parts. Uh, in one way, it's about codes, about encoding parts, uh, the specifications of parts in the modalities of realization. You can think about stylistic, stylistic formalization with Claude Perrault, for example, um, in, the, in the ordering of um, uh, styles of column, or uh, in a more trivial way, construction codes. On the other side, um, and I think it's uh, way more important, um, it's about articulating parts when uh, one is trying to model architecture or to perform modeling through architecture. Uh, articulating parts uh, of different kind together to create meaningful aggregates is basically what I would call a definition for architectonics. Uh, and this can be done in architecture through different logical schemes, functional, symbolic, etc. Um, but you can take as an iconic example, once again, Andrea Palladio um, for, for this matter. Now, coming back to uh, the experiments I'm doing, um, I'm going to illustrate uh, what I mean by trying to aggregate parts in a meaningful way with uh, one project, one outcome, which is called Stargazer, uh, where I'm, I, I was generating two colons for the so -called, from the so-called neural potentials. And you can start to, to understand the process that way. Um, if you try to put non-trivial parts together, uh, which are not expressing any kind of prior formal guidance or syntactical framing on how they should be put together to create some kind of meaning, the first thing you might want to do is just, you know, take them, observe them, and try several times in an inferential fashion how how it would make sense to put them together. And if you find something meaningful, maybe you want to formalize that into uh, a syntactical framing. What is happening when I'm, I'm trying to embed this kind of ideas, this kind of speculation about modeling into a, a much more technical term with BCI, is that uh, while um, I am generating different solutions of uh, aggregating one, two, or several parts together uh, in, a, in a very abundant, uh, in a proficient way of, of possible states. I am proposing this to uh, visual discrimination, uh, to a human for visual discrimination, and score attribute values to those, to those states. When those states are uh, attributed with certain uh, discriminated weight. They are kept by an artificial generator to produce the next level of aggregation based on those discriminated solutions. So in a way, you start to establish a symmetrical condition between human visual discrimination and artificial generation. 
for the so in other words how to start from a meaningless amassing of parts of different kinds to something which is uh, a more meaningful aggregate so on one side you have one colon which uh, through uh, many many iterations of training has been able to encode from an individual the visual discrimination in an iterative fashion of how to put parts together to address to refer to the semantic category of a colon and on the other side you have an artificial generator who learned from that particular individual uh, referencing the category of a colon and reproduced it. So that's a move uh, in this research between syntactical models or syntactical modeling in architecture to informational ones. Okay, well, thank you all so much for your presentations. It was very interesting and exciting to view. And what I can see from all of this that, is that we have different approaches to how to use neuroscience in architectural practices. What's most fascinating right now is the of neuroscience and architecture is to bring the body into the conversations of making architecture. And it's not a new concept. Our bodies in architecture have been part of our history and architectural discipline. However, today, because we're bringing neuroscience in and the ability to measure our bodies, it brings a, another dimension of how we use the science in our practice. With David, the, 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 uh, the sound that changes our taste is super fascinating, the research that has been done in that. Sean, your work with tactility and responsive systems to a, a kind of a interactive architecture as a form of language is a very interesting um, work. And, and then Pierre's, your, your work in vision science and how you decode that kind of neural information into a, an encoding process to make architectural modeling is incredible. And so what I sense is that all of these are in a way architectures, if we understand architectures as a process, as a way of creating our environment, um, these sensory architectures are very dynamic. And when we know that our body is always in a dynamic state, where is the role of dynamic architecture in your view? And how do we bring that into our practice for anyone? Uh, thank you. Uh, well, of course, it's uh, huge. And it's huge uh, in part because the technology of robotics is making it uh, possible to uh, modify not just surfaces, but structural elements in a dynamic way. I remember a long time ago, uh, Jerry Sussman at the AI lab, he talked about making a bridge. And in the old days, you used to make a bridge. Um, you, used to do, you used to calculate the uh, engineering requirements to support a weight of a certain structure going on at, over at a certain velocity. And then he said, well, you know, what if we took the struts and we made them all small and we had little actuators along here. So now when the heavy truck comes at the beginning of the bridge and we're using very thin struts that can't ever support a weight of that amount, we take the, the, the truck and as it goes down and it wants to deform this, this strut because it can't support it, it bends on the pivot and so it passes the force to others, and each one compensates so that we could have a, a structure of a, you know, a, a tiny fraction of the weight and tensile strength of the original bridge. And it's all because we have actuation and ad adaptation throughout this, the matrix of the uh, support system. Now that was 35 years ago. Now we, don't, we, we, we have some of that, but we don't see nearly as much of that, but robotics and new materials are clearly moving in that direction. So given this, assume we have all of that. Now you ask the real question, how does that affect the human relationship to the surfaces and to the activity space that people are in? Well, the, I think if you take a, a, a neuroscientific or a cognitive scientific perspective, you can only answer that question by looking to the various activities and meaning-making activities people are engaged in. So in the case of activities, how would you deform the surface of a, of a kitchen? Well, that has to be in concert with how attention is distributed over the surface, how you keep track of things, how the environment supports information, all of those things, if you want to build an adequate system that lessens, that distributes the cognitive load, both of memory and 
what I have to do next, and it supports me in uh, complex processes, then you have to just treat it as a distributed system. Each and, and cognition flows between the building or the surfaces um, or whatever else we have in there, projection of information, illumination, attention, then something comes light in the surface that calls my attention to when a pot is ready rather than making a terrible noise, which is another way it does it. Those sorts of things are part of a distributed system of cognition. The cognition process now is more distributed and it has to be coordinated. So then the study becomes how do we understand the nature of coordination between the various types of cognitive processing and sensory processing going on, the attention mechanisms, the memory mechanisms, the reasoning mechanisms, the visual reasoning mechanisms, the tactile reasoning mechanisms, all the things that are just barely getting off the ground because people have historically thought that reasoning is mostly linguistic or symbolic. The, the, uh, how do we unify and coordinate those between the environment and the person? So that's with respect to one thing, and I'll leave all the discussion about greater meaning making and social interaction and the role of dynamic buildings in that for another moment. But I think just to kind of comment, I think that um, <clears throat> That's that's one of the kind of key issues right now is that um, I mean the many implications of, of COVID nineteen in terms of how it's going to change our our operations. But we've seen everyone's seen how they've literally had to transform the space in which they've operated. Uh, well, they, they haven't really transformed it as such, but it's become a different kind of space. You know, we, we are uh, we're in this kind of strange world whereby uh, our living room becomes our office. Um, uh, and I was there's a kind of inversion going on. Normally, you get the the, the outside world coming in through your computer and uh, through your television, and that's your glimpse of the outside world. But now somehow the the, the laptops become a portal into the outside world. So we we're actually in a, in a very kind of interesting juncture. Which um, on one hand we are it, it's kind of it's 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 a a world in which the physical world of architecture is actually suffering in the sense we can't. I mean, teaching fabrications is very difficult now. But at the same time. COVID-19 has lots of interesting implications about how we might reconfigure not just architecture, but how our thinking about architecture and how we could kind of get to a point where um, adaptivity, adaptation is kind of central to how we, uh, uh, um, how we address spaces. I suspect it's kind of like a, it's the beginning of a new, a new era in terms of interactive design. Now we are kind of, um, there are reasons to make, make spaces more interactive than they, they have been in the past. So, um, yes. Do you, do you feel, Neil, that that we are waiting we were waiting for the digital digital paradigm for this moment where previously we were testing all of these ideas but now we're it's so essential to us to how we communicate with one another yeah i think i think one thing is is you i think as a force of habit you just carry on doing things in the way that you 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 always have and then you're just forced to, to rethink about things and do things differently but then you realize actually there are new opportunities afforded by this possibility um, and that's in a sense really what this whole platform is about is trying to explore the, the the space of possibilities of going online and connecting in some ways so I, I i think it's a kind of watershed moment um in many ways and it's going to force us to rethink things and, and radically rethink things and from that point of view I mean, every crisis, I mean, everything's like a renaissance is a crisis. You know, you reconfigure your understanding of what the world is. And I think we're going through one right now. And I'm not quite sure how things are going to fall out. Um, but my perception has, has always been that, you know, as architects, we, those of us architects, we, we should be planning, we should be designing, we should be imagining a kind of a different kind of space of opportunities. And, and, uh, and that means not just simply, I think, the physical space in which we're operating. I think the kind of the... The possibility of, of virtual uh, VR, AR, in terms of the kind of spaces in which we we operate, I think, to my mind, Zoom is still quite primitive, you no. Know? But maybe in a few years' time, I think the architectural imagination will be going on board and, and trying to reimagine that space of interaction. So, you know, I, I think it's a, I, I see it as a as, as as a constraint, but also an opportunity to to radically rethink what architecture might be itself. What I think is interesting um, with this discussion is actually, I think. <clears throat> of course, all of these concepts have been there and, and there has been, I would argue, um, when you look in the areas like I do of disability, the necessity has been there as well. And I'd somewhat call it unfortunate that only now the kind of neurotypical audience has realized 
um, such a situation of, of isolation, of environmental impact, especially when that environment is in discord with your expectations, with your um, assumed affordances, with your you know, assumptions in terms of how you possibly wanted to predict its operation. Um, all of these things affect the daily life um, of an individual who's deemed having a disability or seen as, as having a kind of different cognitive perception of the space around them than, than what we might um, understand. So I don't wanna say it's a moment that somehow provides empathy for everybody to that situation because I still don't think it's a kind of truly understandable situation. But in terms of putting these tools to work, it's kind of an insight in terms of um, how, this, how this adaptivity needs to operate um, and how it needs to on a more, I would say on one level individualize, but I think the other thing to consider is that um, it is a social condition. I have a daughter with autism. I am very much a part of her autism. I have to be in order to be able to support it. So you can't just kind of also isolate that and say that this is an individualized condition. This is an individual sensory experience. Um, it's very much a part of the kind of technologies and, and social web in which she exists. So um, uh, there's a general design principle, certainly pushed forward by Herbert Simon, that uh, one way to understand systems is to push them to the extremes and see the way they break or the way they, uh, you know, uh, begin to perform uh, more catastrophically, more quickly degrade. And um, what's interesting, I think, about using uh, accessibility issues or various um, non-standard, I'll just call them non-standard, or let's just say somewhere on the curve, um, the uh, uh, diverse, neurodiverse is a term you've used before, uh, uh, is, is that it's a lovely forcing function to um, uh, understand some of the issues that we don't always see. And I think the COVID case is where there's so many um, elements of COVID case, that uh, COVID uh, consequences of isolation, that it too is a forcing function. So I think it's a nice way to introduce and recognize a set of opportunities or problems that ha architecture has to um, uh, address. W tying it to what Neil was saying before, I, I loved what you were saying. Um, I I've long thought of, um, our environments consisting of, you know, superposition of task environments or layered environments, they're superposed somehow. Um, but, but there's also these things called entry points. You can think of them as what you call portals. What they are, they're non-geometric spaces. Uh, they can be non-geometric spaces. So for instance, when I open a book, I enter the non-geometric space of the book. Now, when I have um, my computer and I'm walking through the room, so I always thought about these things. They always had a geometric location, but you enter them and then it's something different there. The, a taxonomy that's different, a classification system that's different. Whatever it is, there are principles of organization that you have to get understand in order to participate in that space. But um, what I didn't think until you were talking is, well, well, you say, okay, so um, my den is my office sometimes, but just for this actually, um, th then uh, it does reshape my meaning making, but more interestingly, my focus is still substantially on my computer and I have to just make the best I can with this space, but uh, I can move, I can pick it up and move around. Sean just moved his computer all around. So here I am, before I used to think they had a particular place, these sort of semantic, uh, so we're puncturing these, these geometric bubble. And uh, now I think, oh, we have to understand the portability of these different, portals that can be moved around and 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 we're not typically thinking in that way because we haven't conceptualized the environment in a rich enough sense maybe i could i just stated and, and pierre a question um uh, and i'm not i've read a fair amount of, of neuro well a little bit of neuroscience um uh and we just had a conversation with anil seth just recently um uh, in, in relation to certain things. And I guess, you know, one of the things that Anil Seth talks about is how um, our, our view of the world is constructed. And it's a kind of, he describes it as a kind of controlled hallucination. So it's kind of like, there is the world out there, and then there's this interaction with it. Um, 
And I, I was, I, it, I've been in the past been fascinated by how do we understand that interaction has been adaptive. In a sense, we grow into spaces mentally, not physically, but mentally. You know, we, we move into an apartment. We, um, after a while, you feel at home there. And even, you know, even in a kind of squalid hotel room, you know, eventually after about three or four nights, you kind of, you feel yourself at home. And I'm, uh, one of the kind of issues I find is, I mean, the reason why I'm interested in neuroscience um, more and more is that I think what, what is happening is, um, is that some of the ideas that came out of psychoanalysis, um, uh, which were of course suppositions, I mean, you know, Freud supposes there's the unconscious, but it doesn't prove it, you know, so it's, un, it's not substantiated by a kind of um, a, a scientific rigor. But now we're getting scientists like, a neuroscientist like, like Anil Seth, who are backing up these things with, with experimentation, which is supporting the argument. In some cases, it's kind of, corroborating what psychoanalysis was saying. But at the same time, what I've discovered is most neuroscientists hate psychoanalysis. Um, so it's a kind of diff difficult tendency, but I would, I'd be interested in, 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 to know, in knowing what neuroscience says about adaptation itself and how we adapt to spaces. Is, is there a discourse about that? And how do we grow into spaces, familiarize ourselves with spaces and so on? And beyond the physical uh, reconfiguration of spaces that we get interactive, is there a kind of accommodation for that uh, adaptation of the mental space? Okay, I mean, I, I will not uh, answer <laughs> the neuroscientist part, uh, but uh, there is uh, something very interesting which just came up by, by listening to you. Uh, and uh, by looking at the sum of the, of the work presented, I think that no matter what the approach is, um, towards looking at uh, phy human physiological response to a built environment, uh, which kind of, of, of question is being built within that and how it can address the architecture. I think that's a common component, uh, at least one which is interaction, uh, which uh, it's, it's, I feel is essential to approach human cognition. Uh, it's, it's an essential uh, component of also um, uh, study intelligence uh, in a way because uh, of course if you need a body to uh, uh, study intelligence you also need uh, some kind uh, of uh, you need to model some kind of interaction so i i found this very interesting interesting that this is a common uh, uh, common pattern in in every field uh, of study for for that matter and but uh, m more interestingly, uh, there are some uh, more reminiscent uh, ideas of architecture which are, are just popping out all the time when, when this uh, topic is uh, coming around. Where basically, when we talk about uh, uh, human response to the built environment or adaptation, there is, of course, in the background, the dimension of time which is predominant and uh, which also recalls to the way <clears throat> uh, such dimension was extremely important in the time of Renaissance architecture, for example, in the progressive meaning of buildings uh, or the progressive meaning of modeling buildings. So in, in the way to design, in the way to appreciate those. Uh, so um, I would say it's not, um, there is, there is a trail of discussion about all the techniques and all about the, the actual problems uh, which are uh, relevant to that topic, but there is also in the background something extremely uh, foundational to the way architecture are, have built their uh, models of thinking. And uh, there is also, uh, I just recall something a bit more um, uh, recent, uh, which uh, was uh, an, an actual debate between Ben van Berkel and Aram Kulas, two, two architects which were debating about uh, dynamic versus generic design, like how much adaptation one should embed into a building to respond to the diversity of, of, uh, of human activity uh, at large. And um, there were also a ton of, of um, intent uh, towards dynamic architecture uh, for structural design, for some more formal approaches, um, you know, uh, Kilian, Knox, um, uh, all those people, and um, also Decoy, for example. 
Um, so, but at the end of the day, all those uh, tries, all those experiments, never quite managed to reach uh, a, a meaningful architectural point in a way that there were always some kind of either technical limitations or a very limited amount of information it could provide it could provide to to a human or to the into back into the environment in general as some kind of novelty or as some kind of uh, you know enrichment of such environment so the the, the problem i i kind of always find uh, when when this question is coming about interacting to a, with an environment and try to find some kind of um uh how do you say uh, a, a kind of positive uh, adaptation between uh, between two entities um such as a, as a human body and its uh, its direct uh, environment is that there is always some kind of limitation in the form of, in in the the quality of information you can provide in how much novelty you can embed all the time. There is always a boundary to it in the system, in the interaction you model for that. So I think that's one kind of problem, which is extremely relevant to architecture because the, the meaning of architecture it lies in semantics at the end of the day, which is always drifting, which is not necessarily bound to a physical apparatus uh and uh that makes uh, a kind of a shaky shaky relation between what to implement in terms of design which could provide a good uh a good setup for such uh, adaptive discourse so I, i'm 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 not saying i have a good solution for that i'm i'm just saying that uh the, there are precedents of this in uh, architectural discourse and practice, uh, and we never found it quite right. I, I think we will never find it anyway. That's that's kind of the goal as well. Uh, but it, 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 I think it's good to put it out there for the discussion. Could I just kind of maybe to, to amplify that question a bit more um, and sort of bring in some of the work that, that Sean's been working on um, and the and the relevance of that is. The one, one thing I discovered in, in my research was that even though we would adapt to eventually everything, you know, even in San Quentin in a prison, you eventually feel at home there, you know, maybe precisely because it's so alienating. Um, that's, it doesn't mean to say that as architects, we should just design San Quentin. What it basically kind of says, if we have this tendency to want to adapt to our space, to grow into our space, that's the role of design in a way to help facilitate that process. And there's a concept that um, Adorno has called sensuous correspondence, whereby the, it kind of a, a design allows us to kind of connect in a certain kind of way. Um, and it's a kind of the way that Adorno talks about it. It's a kind of non linguistic notion. It's kind of very almost like a kid, actually, like a the sort of pre or rather pre linguistic, the kind of way in which we can engage where, where design can come in. Is, is not a kind of, a, it's intellectual, it's a kind of bodily thing. And I'm just thinking about Sean's um, environments for his autistic kid that kind of allows this kind of connection in some way. So the question really is, 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 is from a neuroscientific perspective, what role does good design have in facilitating the kind of adaptation to spaces? Beyond the physical adaptation to spaces, why would design, um, make us feel more at home um is, is that i mean i can i know this the psychoanalytic, psychoanalytic kind of viewpoint but i'm interested in what the neuroscientific point of view might be on that is that i'd I like to focus for a moment on the act the original question when you got used to your hotel room and uh that's a really interesting thing really right this adaptation so the optimist what is the environment and the question about what is the environment is interesting in part because um the way Anil would look at it, who's a radical and activist about these matters, uh, the, 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 an activist see the environment as a consequence really of two things. One is that um, we have changed blindness, that is things can change in the environment that we don't notice. The famous case of uh, you know putting a gorilla through people playing, pushing a ball to each other. They never noticed the gorilla walking between them because they were counting the number of bounces in the ball. And uh, 
uh, the, the so their attention was not on the gorilla, and as it, it was so gross that they didn't even see that. So the, there are a number of uh, examples like change blindness or attention blindness that make us say that we don't see all the environment, we don't see all that there is, and of course there's tons of details we never never see unless we focus on them, and you can change them and we never notice them. And then the opposite thing is we complete. So you see a little thing behind, a, a fragment of a word, and you complete the word. You see an occluded piece of furniture, you complete the piece of furniture. So on the basis of partial stimuli, we complete it. So we see more than there might be. So on the one hand, we see more than there is because we are projecting or completing it to the norm. And we miss stuff that's in it because we are not noticing important changes in it. The consequence of that can be overblown into radical inactivism. I'd say it's overblown. But of course, there is a lot of uh, pushing that can happen. Now, leaving that aside, there's another big drive here that I think is really consequential, and that is the consequence of expertise and the consequence of adaptation with respect to a task. So when somebody leaves their ordinary kitchen and they have to make a uh, um, a recipe in a foreign kitchen, they're so much slower. They're, they're prone to error of a sort that they aren't prone to in their own kitchen. So clearly they can't map right away their understanding of the activity space from their own kitchen into the other kitchen. And there's this long period of adaptation as you slowly begin to reshape the mappings, all the time constrained by the needs of the task. So that's not yet an open environment. Now, if you're living in your uh, hotel room, what are the tasks that you have to perform? Sorry, I'm having trouble hearing you. Excuse me. Um, she should have heard. I mean, what's the matter? I think she meant I'm having trouble understanding you. Um, <laughs> uh, so I guess I want to just say this. Every environment we in, we're in, will be seen differently according to the level of expertise we have with respect to the tasks we perform. An expert does not look at the kitchen the way a novice looks at the kitchen. An expert adapts to a different kitchen in a different way than a novice adapts to a different kitchen. The kitchen is a superposition of dozens of activity spaces depending upon what you have to do in the kitchen. So that kitchen, what is that kitchen? And every time you assume the state that goes with having this task present, that reshapes the perceived affordances. I'm not saying it reshapes the affordances, but the perceived affordances, the affordances we attend to, and the, the, the discriminations that lead to affordances. So the last comment, and then I leave it, is, is since an affordance is defined relative to an action repertoire. If you change a person's action repertoire, you change the affordances. So if I can cut only with a certain degree of precision, then, the, then I'm incapable, it, the, the environment does not afford me making cuts of greater precision. Uh, and so I can't use the knife the same way as the other. The knife does not afford that to me. So we, the, the state of the underlying state of the persons, the competence, the skills, all of these things change the environment according to the environment construed as what affordances are present. So, uh, you know, it's a big story and the neural basis of that has to be pulled out from, from the long story of explaining change blindness and attention blindness and the development of expertise and what happens to the perceptual system when you tune it to a task and all of those things and the body too, because the body has to perform differently. I think, um, I mean, am I trying, trying to speak to that, but I think also what was mentioned about like, what can design do about it or what are the limits of, the de of design? Um, and for me, I mean, that's, that's an incredibly critical question. Um, you know, obviously design is also in this moment of having to deal with issues, you know, race related and representation and voice and equality. Um, and, I, and I think arguably that, that kind of plays into this as well. Um, I think the practice can only do so much to try and understand 
the context in which it puts itself, i.e. the architecture, the kitchen, you know, whatever it might be. There's only so much that can be understood. And, and I think the key thing is, you know, every moment, every decision you make in design arguably introduces bias. And, you know, the, the less informed that bias, obviously the worse it is, but is it ever going to be a fully cognizant decision that can answer, you know, every capability? And again, that's what I learned from my daughter, like trying to understand her state and make decisions for her is a very dark tunnel to head down. <laughs> Um, and I just had to make the decision that all I can do is give her as much autonomy as possible. And from that, good decisions can emerge. Um, so for me, it is a very clear question of when can we almost stop design as early as possible and seed as much agency into what we would call maybe more the design of experience, I guess, if you want to call that, you know, physical things can only change so much visual things can only change so much. Um, you know, how, how quickly can we come to that point and how rich can that other side of the story be that when we call it architecture, it's <laughs> about somebody's, um, you know, individual expression. Because um, I, I think the, you know, the, the one thing that I see as a part of that is, um, you know, what is individual expression and, you know, as a, as a designer, we're very creative individuals. Um, <clears throat> and I think in this kind of COVID moment, we try to apply that creativity, of course, to, to better adapt, to better understand how we can make these spaces more adaptable. Instead of the office, it's something more, it's something multifaceted, something multifunctional. Um, and I think you're experiencing, again, what you know somebody who just doesn't fit in in terms of their ability, I think it's kind of the same thing. You expend a crap load of, of creativity just trying to situate yourself, and then you're left with nothing else to try and actually be yourself, right? I mean, I mean these Zoom days are just draining, right? Um, because you just, you've spent so much effort to try and convince yourself you're comfortable. There's nothing less to, left to actually express the ideas you want to express. And I think it's the same thing in architecture on a bigger scale. You know, people who don't fit in have to use all a pretty amazing amount of and a pretty amazing, unique creativity um, to make it fit for themselves as best possible to deal with, you know, to, to deal with the resiliency that they might not have to just normally adapt. Um, and, and I think that's, you know, I, I mean, that's a fundamental error. And I think it's because of um, the kind of bias that, that, you know, an individual design decision uh, makes and, and, you know, prevents that kind of agency to fit and express yourself. <clears throat> so just one thing, can I, can I emphasize that um, we always should be thinking of co-adaptation and we should be thinking of, uh, I, I think the notions of agency are complicated. Um, when two people are together, where is the agency? And, and if a building could ever do what you do for your daughter. Sometimes you compliment, sometimes you push, sometimes you try to make her make all the stuff, other times you do the support. That very changing line of where the uh, sort of initiative is coming from, even though her initiative is there, but it's hidden or it's unknown or it's something. So one could begin to study the nature of people's interaction together and then to try to draw some inferences as to how the building can co-adapt with people. Uh, it's easiest when we have a task. So how does a building co-adapt when we have a task? It, then the challenge becomes how do, we uh, how do we classify tasks? So clearly we're engaged in a task now, but um, often, you know, do you call watching TV a task? You might, you always can. There, So uh, I, I think, that's part of the changing meaning world that Pierre was mentioning over time, the whatever we think these things are. I don't know if that's the right formalism to use any longer, but it, it really opens up the, the world to think co, everything co. I guess what, I, what, what really interests me, is I'm intrigued by, by, by Sean's daughter, um, the fact that she's nonverbal. Now that, to my mind, means that her kind of communication with the world is primarily a sensuous one. 
Now, given the, the kind of this description I was laying out before about Adorno's theory that actually the way we engage with, with, with um, the aesthetic domain, it's, it's, it's pre-linguistic. It's, it's a kind of, he, he uses actually language of a kid, of, of coaxing, of this kind of very nurturing environment. And I'm wondering, um, since, since your daughter's nonverbal, whether, what's the difference? I mean, does she have a, a privileged access to that in, in, in terms of how she engaged with those kind of cocoon-like environments that you've designed for her? How does her interaction with that space differ from other people's? I mean, I think in terms of being nonverbal, um, there's a, I'm, I'm blanking on her first name, but a, a woman, her last name, uh, Carly, Carly Fleischman. Um, she's nonverbal, but um, you know, her name pops up here and there. She has a YouTube channel. Um, and as she wrote, uh, it's, it, it means that everything is communication. <laughs> so not even just that, that kind of like tactile interaction um, but, you know, it's, it's, it's this, you know, amazing ad hoc um, multimodal uh, communication. So therefore, you know, it's a new, it's a new language. It's a language that I don't know. So in terms of engaging in these environments, it's maybe my bias, but to me, it's about finding the moments that she is trying to teach me something, whether that's overtly or not. Um, something about, you know, a, a fascination with surface and how is that fascination so intriguing that she wants to tell me about it, that she wants to, or have me participate in it to feel it. Um, so uh, to me, kind of, it becomes a point of communication. It may be over reading that she's trying to commu communicate something, um, but when it is everywhere, then, then you're trying to pull, you know, whatever you can to try and build up what is that, you know, um, what is that curriculum, <laughs> what is that book um, that would define uh, her language? Yeah, I, I guess, I mean, what, what, I, what we've discovered, there was a, a young, I, I forget his name now, but a, a, a few years ago, a young seven-year-old um, kid who was autistic, who had the most incredible capacity, this is back in the UK, to, to draw by memory of some, from sure, from, sure. Uh -huh. some things. And I think what, what we're discovering is that, I mean, that, so autism and um, Asperger's being another example of a way that uh, Greta Thunberg um, is apparently Asperger's. I mean, right. she clearly has a really astonishing capacity. So my interest is kind of like, you know, even though uh, one might be cognitively impaired in one domain, is there an enhanced uh, um, receptivity in other domains that, that other people don't have? I mean, that's the, um, the, the kind of, it, it is in the presentation, um, it's called this uh, differential susceptibility uh, graph. Um, and us being, you know, the, the neurotypical being defined as resilient and of environmental stimuli can be essentially managed, right? Or we have the ability to be able to retrain ourselves to it um, or change it itself. Um, somebody who is maybe more predisposed, um, often what happens because, you know, when you call disable, you want to just pinpoint the deficiencies, right? So often when you say somebody's predisposed, it means, you know, um, uh, you know, loud noises, big spaces are too overwhelming and, and you know, they have to retract, they're, they're withdrawn, so on and so forth. But if you follow that line of somebody who's predisposed, yes, the negative can have detrimental effects because they don't have the tools of resiliency to thrive within it. But the opposite end of that line says that um, the right kind of social sensory support and interaction actually has extra beneficial effects, more so than it might be for us. The right environment may feel good, but um, you know, for the neurotypical, but it won't necessarily say that you're going to have beneficial developmental effects in terms of that comes from that space. Um, so I, I think following that that um, that hypothesis, following that kind of theory, then certainly it does. And then for me, the, the ongoing quest is what are those key moments, and does architecture house those key moments? for her to be able to explore and say, no, not that one, yes, this one. Um, and then I think the other thing, and, and this maybe 
talks back to what David was was mentioning before. I don't think it's that all architecture has to become this, and this is maybe where neuroscience can start to provide a better understanding. How much of a kind of agential architecture, an architecture of agency, of what sampling do you need of that to provide um, a, more of an equality outside of the neurotypical and sort of the bias of, of who's been authoring that space? To me, that's kind of the, the sort of meta question. Not, can everything be smart and responsive and changeable and malleable and transformable? It's just how many moments have to be that way um, and, and how variant can they be in order to, to be defined as truly adaptive um, and, and spaces of inclusion and equality? Yeah, that's pretty provocative because uh, um, thinking about personalization or customization of a space uh, is term, in terms of how the, the architecture adapts, um, we're all different. So, uh, you know, it, it, of course, everything's on, the, on some kind of curve of degree of difference. And unless you take prior judgment as to which one is more important or so, so she that may not perform as well on a variety of tasks, but we don't necessarily have an appropriate characterization an appropriate metric of what her meaning spaces are looking like. And, and so, yeah, she's not doing it on these spaces, but if we had these spaces and we knew how to measure, maybe we would find she's a real outlier on those spaces. Uh, so I, I think it's a great question about um, how much, every environment should adapt to uh, a different person. You know, what do they see? How sensitive are they to the colors and the lights and the, you know, some people it make a big difference, some people it doesn't make a big difference. The, the textures, the smells, and that we know there's such big differences. Uh, one in five are super tasters and have a super nose. And, you know, and, and they, they live in a different world than uh, uh, other people. And, so much change, individual difference. Could, could, could I just pick up something? Um, so just to say that the, it's Stephen Wilshire, who was the, actually when he was first famous, he was a young boy, now he's 46 years old. So he's no longer a young boy. But um, the, the other thing I wanted to kind of raise, you know, the other issue that we have, and it, it kind of connects as well with the, um, uh, the, the, the with Sean's world. Um, and I'm interested from a kind of neuroscientific point of view, the other aspect that we, we have to deal with is, the kind of social distancing that we're facing and, and not touching and not you know connecting and indeed standing so dis apart from people and and all that which is you know really a, a challenge um so the, the loss of that kind of physical um uh intimacy and and and, and simple touching what a touching what impact what impact might that have on on us from a kind of neuroscientific point of view and what are the negative impacts maybe? We can see an analysis of what um, sort of full-blooded social interaction is. And um, I, I think full-blooded social interaction is, has got these things which make, which, which are essential to co-located interaction, but which we'd like to sort of achieve a little more in non-co-located interaction or somehow diminished interaction because of various factors. So. One thing we would like to get is uh, everything is shared. Uh, it seems to me that full-blooded social interaction um, has, has uh, these important parts that are often neglected, that if you're together, you're participating often in a, often, not necessarily, but first off, if something happens in the environment, you all know it. If there's a big bang, you all hear it. So that's uh, the shared experience, but the ex shared experience in this case, where they're performing a task together, that's much different. If the uh, their sensory motor engagement of the space is shared, their their emotions are shared. There's a, a short shared valuation because you know you hurt somebody, you know you hurt somebody, they know you hurt them. There's a there's valuation that's shared. All these things are so much built into the present that is so complicated and it's very much requires having a body in that space and is situated to the activity that's going on. Now the, um, uh, the, the thing that the neuroscientists have found is that watching social interaction between two people is different 
than when you actually have skin in the game and you're participating with other people. I care about the effect I'm having on you in a way in which I have less care when I'm watching two people interact. And so it turns out that there are a variety of neural centers involved in those sorts of uh, interactions where you have skin in the game and that you're participating in the topic and the focus of the ongoing interactions. And so what would be interesting to see is if we can begin to manipulate environmental conditions which stimulate parts of these systems. So even if we can't duplicate the whole co-located experience when someone is remote or when we are sharing through some other mediated platform other than um, the uh, uh, closeness in physical space, we, we could see the effects of these and incrementally we could hope to come to um, uh, a, a better, better, uh, in, in, we could hope, hope to come to better coordination and um, complete, more complete social interactions. So I think that's the great promise of uh, neuroscience and cognitive science, but in this case, it is even more neuroscience and cognitive science. Socio-neuroscience has got an opportunity to introduce understanding of, of small manipulations to the environment, which could have outsized effects. So I, I've had limited experience with VR, I mean, many years ago, and then recently I had a lovely experience where, uh, I'm sorry, I can't attribute it to the graduate student who made this, but it was at the Bartlett, and we put the VR glasses on, we were in a smallish space, um, and the VR world was utterly, completely different. Like you were gonna walk through this across a bridge and then you're gonna wash your face uh, or you were gonna get involved in something and come around. And in fact, you were really just perambulating in a narrow circuit, but in VR, you were moving quite a large uh, area. And then there was water outside. So when you splashed it, you actually saw the rest of the whole um, uh, universe uh, there, the actual environment. And it seemed remarkably real that when you take off the glasses, you felt, oh, wait a second, I need a moment to adapt to the mundaneness of this environment. You mean this really environment, this, this, this 10, this 15 square feet was actually that large space I was wandering around? So how do we make sense of that? It, it, because, so you're giving people the visual input, periodically you're giving them the, the, the sensory, you know, you, they are walking. The fact that they're walking like this is less important than the fact that they walk that distance. So um, they, that's overriding the sense that I turned or something. Um, uh, although you, you register these things. So she was clever in how she did that. And uh, you get the, the water. And, but it's the, so there's all this completion going on because we have sens sensory modal um, uh, sorry, we have modal interaction that is not exactly the same as it would be in real life. So the, the some modalities are swamping with a little hint from the outside, say the water, and we can get the, the whole visual experience of being in a fountain. And uh, so th that is a fundamentally neuroscientific question, how much you can um, change a person's experience, giving them a certain sense of something, that's like the inactivist view, um, by, by actually only giving them a fraction of something over here, but a lot of, say, vision and a little bit of feeling of the water. Um, so I think VR is quite a long way off to being uh, effectively done in a neuroscientific manner, but um, there's a lot of experiments people want to be doing that try things out, Obviously, the future is going to be filled with it. I just hope that we don't have to wear the AR glasses. Uh, you know, it's it's got to be more in the environment in natural way. Debbie, can I can I pick up that there's something maybe the, the domain of, of VR and AR might have an advantage. I mean, one thing I've noticed, and it's come up in a couple of talks already, um, it, this format actually is surprisingly successful in the sense that we people are much more forthcoming with their comments than maybe ordinarily they, they would be. Um, I, the, the, the analogy I made before was um, in the Catholic Church, they have this thing called the confessional, and you can't really see 
the priest. There's a screen, and you kind of you go along. I mean, I haven't been to church for years, so but you, you go along and you, and you you confess, and then you get whatever you know. You get you get told to say certain prayers. Now, the interesting thing about this that the point was made by Daniel Bolajan um, in another talk. He said, well, you know, what they're discovering with people with post-traumatic stress disorder. They find it easier to speak to a bot, to speak to a virtual being, be, be, and the left self, left self conscious about it. And in terms of, in terms of the treatment for post uh, traumatic stress disorder, the virtual domain, the, the AI bot and things, actually is a better way to communicate. I'm intrigued to know how you might uh, explain that or otherwise. Well, you remember Jerry Weisenberg back uh, in the old days of Eliza, 1970, where Eliza. Um, was taught to give um, routinized answers in the form of psychoanalysis, not sorry, um, in, in, a, in a psychological setting. So you would say something and Eliza would say, repeat it under very small variations in linguistic context. She'd repeat what you said, or he would repeat um, what you said. And, and she would say, oh, so you feel that it's unhappy when you go back to your parents' house. It's enough to do with me. I just chose anything old. And, uh, uh, and that's all that Eliza did. And what they discovered was that some people, some very clever people, would go on and on and on with Eliza for 45 minutes. And all Eliza was doing was the simplest linguistic transformations. This was really simple, simple stuff. Uh, so, now, might it be the case that that is helpful to people, given that a certain sort of psychotherapy was based on echoing back to the person what they just said, but asking them to elaborate it a little bit? Tell me more about why you feel, and so on. So, yes, okay, I can see that some people who might like psychoanalysis or psychiatry of that sort might find a kindred spirit in this area, but um, uh, it's... Yeah, sure. There'll be lots of things that are coming out great from the VR world, and maybe it is good for PTSD. But uh, I'll be surprised if it's nearly as good as sending them back in the hyper VR uh, hyper VR world, where they have to duplicate the setting where the bad thing happened that really gave them the where their buddy got blown up and splattered all over them, and they now had an opportunity to react in a different way under a controlled setting. And they keep going back and back and back until they habituate to that buddy being splattered all over them. And now they can react to it differently because they've habituated to the horror of that. So I, 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 there's a great place for VR and all sorts of things. And it may not be Eliza, but maybe it is Eliza too. Um, maybe going, <clears throat> going back to those couple of slides you showed, the one, the one thing that I was struck by was, of course, you know, being an architect, the visual of the picture of the father with what was likely his two sons, I suppose, um, which of course that's a social circumstance that is possible right now and, you know, arguably might be carried on the same way as it was carried on before. But um, what, what I thought was interesting to think about was the fact that obviously it's certain social situations are still possible, but maybe, um, location, the places in which they can happen is, is constrained, but then there are a lot of other social situations that aren't possible. Obviously, meeting with colleagues face-to-face um, -face is not possible anymore. Meeting with friends is much less possible, children's friends, children's families. Um, and, and that's maybe, you know, one thing that, that in, in all of this talk of social interaction, like, actually hasn't been scrutinized, and I would be interested to know um, you know, is there, when, when a lack of social exposure, um, does that get defined by a certain threshold? Does that get defined at a threshold of as long as I have my family unit, I can actually function okay? Is there a, a higher threshold of no, the kind of, it, 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 I don't know, ideal or, or let's say individually, there are structures where one person is fine with their family, another person, no, it's a family, it's friends, it's random people, you know, whatever. Um, I think like that kind of web, what is the construction of that web that somebody would define as being either fulfilling their kind of 
social, um, uh, you know, um, yeah, their fulfillment of social interaction or, you know, defining it as being constrained um, or overly constrained. Yeah, so some, some work has been done in HCI um, that was quite interesting and bears to some degree on what you're saying. So uh, I remember some work in the Media Lab uh, where what they did was they had um, kids in one room playing on a surface. Uh, you roll out something and they're playing on it and they're toys like this. And then the projections coming down onto that. Uh, so it's an augmented reality kind of thing, but without the glasses. So they, they had some kind of projection, something. I don't know exactly how they did. Uh, and and um, uh, that was related to what the other kids were doing in, a, in an approximately identical situation. So unlike us, where we just are inside the little box here, there's no periphery, there's no environment, there's just the box here. And it's, it's, it's a highly artificial context in which to chat with people with, with all that stuff. I mean, the notion of closeness is completely distorted, right? And, and so um, uh, what they tried to do was enable the other person's actions to be reflected in the person's environment in a much more um, overlapping manner. So we don't have any overlap, right? There's no overlap in our, in our little mosaic world here. And um, so I, I, you raise such complicated questions about, well, what about the social, the, the invisible support, social support structure, or even the visible social support structure? You know, just the fact that your daughter might feel that you are just a, uh, just beside her, no, but not maybe visible, but right beside her, gives her a level of confidence as it does for kids. I, I do woodworking. And um, what I found is that if somebody is with me, I'm much more courageous. I, I'll do anything anyway now. But nonetheless, if someone's with me, boy, I'll go faster and take more risks. Uh, not danger risks, but like design risks or, you know, got to do this. Can, can we got the tolerance right? And we'll, we'll get it right. But something about having the support of another human just changes the whole thing. I'm sure in battle too, courage, because of the social nature of courage, uh, it's going to change. Together. So, uh, David, can I, while you're there, I, I, I really want to just pick your brains. One thing that what we've noticed that happened, it, alongside COVID-19, we had Black Lives Matter. Now, of course, there was a direct connection there. The African-American community suffered greatly from COVID-19. But I'm just wondering to what extent the kind of, um, uh, the kind of, the being closeted away in the, in the you know, lockdown, um, of kind of in a compensatory moment, you know, somehow generated this kind of desire to go out there on the streets and, and kind of protest. Because there's, there are other things that have happened that I find very strange. Um, not that that's strange, but in itself. But I've noticed that, that now everyone, I live on Venice Beach, and, and people are setting off fireworks. I don't know why. And they're literally all over the place, all the time, fireworks. And is there is there some kind of kind of cognitive or neuroscience explanation of a kind of compensatory mechanism whereby we could explain this kind of group movement and fireworks and so on? I don't know. I don't know. I, I mean, there is there. We do know that when you think you are not doing anything, there's a sort of underlying ambient state going on, and it has a certain stimulation structure and it, it, but it's it, it's it, there are things going on when you think you're not doing anything. Okay, so uh, whenever you look at the sea, whether it's rough or whether it's smooth, it's something, and there's, there's still something going on in the sea. So the brain, we know. I mean, I don't know a lot about the brain, but we know that much. And um, uh, now, why people would uh, hanker for stimulation? One thing is that it's outside. So fireworks are outside, and I'm sure the effect of fireworks outside is much greater than the effect of watching fireworks of equal volume and equal resolution on your screen uh, TV at home. So it could be a, a distributed social engagement because there is, you do know that other people are seeing it too from their perspective, and it is a kind of social act. Uh, that performance, it's a performance, it's a live performance, it's physical, 
it's out there, and you kind of have a relationship to it. I mean, it would be wonderful if you could hear other people say, ooh, and aw, with the fireworks, and maybe you can, I don't know, or even in your house, or maybe the neighbors. That would be a social engagement mediated by this outside thing. So that's exactly the kind of question that goes with what is full-blooded social interaction when you are stimulating a little part of the system. And, you know, we're not having mirror neurons here because it's the, uh, unless you believe, and we don't, that the exploding firework stimulates some, it doesn't. So, um, you know, but there's something that's being stimulated and it's in the social cognition, the social neuroscience network, the networks that people are talking about, but it's a fractional thing. So I, it seems to me that progress in this area will come when we can begin to isolate. If I do this, this correlational thing, it has some effect, but of course it's a system in here, so the effect isn't one, one. It's gonna be theory, oh yeah, it has some effect, but you know, it depends on so many other things, as it always do, does when it's a system. But that will come, and then we'll be able to answer your interesting questions. I wanted to ask Pierre a question here. When we're talking about all the the social interactions and neurodiversity and adaptation, how does that come to back to your work? I know it's not directly related to your work, but you are taking neural responses in the brain for the production of an architectural element or architectural um, um, spaces. How do you explain neurodiversity in the production? It's hard to say because um, what I'm looking at, first of all, is into a certain kind of embedded cognitive capacity within a single individual first. Uh, and then the question of whether or not this can be applied uh, in a more general way to many other people and produce much more diversity is another, another question for technical reasons, but also for, for uh, theoretical ones. So, I mean, first of all, the idea is that uh, within the visual cognitive process that uh, every visually abled person is having, there is a, a, a linguistic process uh, as well, which is uh, in information, uh, to, um, which is in formation, uh, over time to, to produce meaningful representational content. So uh, uh, what, is, what is going on with the kind of experiment that I'm trying to do, and, and there is interaction because there is visual feedback, uh, and uh, an, adaptive, an adaptive one uh, is that uh, through those brain computer interfaces, one tries to map uh, certain kind of values which are indexed to semantic categories. So that's that's how it works very roughly. And and the name of the game is is like in every game in in uh, cognitive science is to correlate uh, human physi physiological response this kind of phenomena to uh, in that case a visual phenomena uh, occurring co-occurring um, in the uh, physical world so uh, yeah that's that's how it works uh, but uh, it, it's not directly addressing the question of diversity like that uh, what it is trying to do is to define a way to form uh, things over time which might reinforce certain uh, concepts through the formation of, uh, of uh, through the, so the indexing of semantic categories, which might not need any kind of um, pre-specific framing, pre-specific syntactical framing. In that way, it may address a more diverse range of, uh, of formalization of representational content. In that sense, it can address a certain kind of diversity. And also in a way that uh, there might be a, a virtuous, uh, some kind of virtuous loop between uh, what is the kind of capacity one may tap into uh, human cognition or this kind of uh, modeling of intelligence found in humans. 
through the study of vision uh, and the capacity of, uh, of a machine, of uh, the artificial modeling of intelligence into uh, re-encoding that capacity and reproducing it in a, in a very abundant fashion. So that's, that's basically how it works. So, um, oh, I'm sorry. So I'd like to tie this to have Sean um, give a reply here. Yes, Sean, you can raise your eyes. Uh, to give Sean, give a reply to that in the following way. So um, one of the big differences between the approach uh, that was spawned by situated and bodied um, cognition is that there is room for the non-conceptual content. So non-conceptual content is non-linguistic content. And uh, what it means, and it's, it, and it's not necessarily shared content um, in the way in which uh, typically, if it's language, it's public, and if it's pub public, it means that we can share the same notion and triangulate through reference on the same thing. Now, when somebody says, where is that sound? This is interesting because I don't know if it'll work for you. Uh, so I go like this. What does my knowledge of where the sound is what does my knowledge consist in? Now, if I had conceptual knowledge, my knowledge would be an objective formulation of where the sound was. But I don't have an objective conceptualization of where the sound was. Uh, I, I could have my eyes closed and I, I wouldn't know even how big the space was. And yet I would say that the sound is over there. Well, okay, it's over, it's over there. And I go like this. So you say, so what is that knowledge? And the knowledge, many people think, consists in an underlying set of capacities to orient to the sound. So I turn to the right place. I duck in the appropriate manner. I do the, appro I do the things that are uh, sort of uh, sensorily motor, uh, motorically appropriate. And if you ask me, well, where is it? <laughs> I may or may not be able to say, oh, it's two feet to the right of me, but a little bit back, or I can't. Now, if I can't, you know for sure I don't have public conceptual knowledge. I have what many people think is this non-conceptual orienting bodily capacity, the sensuous nature of that. And now, Sean, the reason it's about you, well, really, it's about your understanding of your daughter, you have been impressed and talked about the degree to which she lives in a non-linguistic world. And so, you know, does that mean she has this hugely rich non-conceptual grasp of the world? Or does she have our non-conceptual grasp of the world, but we just don't know what it is? Or, I mean, uh, other than she knows where, you know, she knows what here means, that's for sure. Or, you know, where did that sound? She has all of those. But she might have a whole other set of things tied to her various specific abilities and skills and the way she copes and, and adapts and stuff. What do you think? I mean, obviously, now you're posing quite complicated questions. <laughs> um, <laughs> she can want to give the answer? <laughs> OK. <laughs> um, so uh, I think, um, to me, one thing that that, that provokes um, provokes me to think about is um, the difficulty in giving that answer. The problem is that I would love for it. I would love for um, her education to be about uh, enabling her to better communicate what that language is to communicate her linguistics. The problem is education for somebody who is disabled special you know has special needs it's really about trying to normalize right it's about trying to introduce the accepted ways of communicating as the vehicle by which they can ben better enter society so now it becomes this really convoluted thing right like she might tr be trying to express something in the way that I or her teacher or somebody else, but probably can't do it in the quite accurate way 
So then it's, you know, this muddied version of half her version of the language and half her version of something else. For but a long want, time, you want her sensuous understanding of it. If, if you could have the sensuous, like the here, the here, my here, yeah. here. Sure, sure. For you, but, but, so we use the word here, but, but what she really understands and what we really understand, both of us understand is with respect to me. You know, in sure. this case far, this case close. And, and that's not going to come out in language. It's going to come out in some other expressive capacity or the, uh, you know, sensory motor interaction with the world through which she's conceptual, not, I'm not allowed to use the word conceptualizing, through which she is sort of engaging the world in an organized and principled manner. But we just don't see the principles and the organizational structure. Sure. I mean, I think it's very true, and I'm not sure how you collect that, honestly. Um, I mean, the best example that I know of that is maybe trying to connect some of those dots is there's a colleague at Northeastern, his name is Matthew Goodwin, um, something, somebody who I've been talking with for a few years and trying to find the moment we can collaborate. Um, he's, he's, he's spent, you know, the past 20, 30 years working with people in autism. Um, and he's now focusing on, on the use of like a, a biometric, you know, pretty fancy biometric kind of risk sensor that captures what, three or four different variables. Um, he's trying to see if you link those four variables together, can you find the precursor moment by which something in a child's environment has changed and is about to trigger um, some sort of uh, negative behavior, some sort of um, negative response, some sort of you know um, reaction, uh, reaction to somebody in their um, context. So, um, you know, he shows an example of a child who is sitting somewhat quietly. You can see they they kind of want to be left alone to a certain degree, but you know, the longtime therapist that he'd been working with and had a good rapport. Um, was trying to pull him out of it very slowly and respectfully, of course. And just up out of nowhere, the child kind of sits straight up and whacks him across the top of the head. Um, and, and, you know, now these things quickly escalate, right? Um, no matter your own response, this child realizes that's not an acceptable behavior and unfortunately may not have the, the, the means to, to resolve their own emotion in that moment. So it escalates quite quickly. Um, they haven't published this research, so they're still, you know, trying to dig into it. But, you know, there were things like, you know, 15 seconds before that, there was a kind of spike in a couple things that might be the indicator that says, oh, something's about to happen. We need to change, you know, A, B, or C um, to do it. Um, so to me, you know, now that you maybe have some of that underlying information, maybe that starts to unravel what that behavior or, or what that um, action of sitting at a desk with his head down, how that was actually meaningful, right? You might think it's just, oh, I'm tired, but obviously it was meaning something very, very different um, for this child. So to me, that's been the only example um, of, of trying to understand um, some of that, you know, non-linguistic language, if I'm understanding it uh, correctly with, with how you're defining it. Otherwise, to me, it, it feels like it goes down that, that troublesome black hole of trying to understand something that I will never understand, nor should be able to understand. I mean, this is somebody else's cognition of the world. Um, should I really be able to understand it so as to predict what might happen? Um, for us, for us again, you know, it's about building that book. All circumstances are so different from each other. It's just cataloging all of those circumstances to maybe kind of draw inferences of what might happen. But I'll tell you, it's 50-50 in terms of us getting it right. Um, so for me, that's the the challenge of trying to answer that question. I feel like it goes, you know, somewhat down a dangerous route um, of thinking you can predict, but really not being able to, and those predictions being more problematic than helpful. Could, could I, I don't know if there's time you have left, but um, there's one thing again, I want to go and bounce off the, all of you, actually. Um, the one of, I mean, one of the things that uh, I picked up from 
uh, let's say Damasio's thinking is that the brain is not a com command control center so much as this kind of almost like a balancing device where you get this kind of uh, dynamic equilibrium it's kind of searching for. Maybe I've, I've paraphrased that too, too literally, but the idea that's kind of compensatory, it's a kind of compensatory mechanism. And one thing I think we've all experienced um, uh, uh, to some extent is as the world gets more disembodied, as we end up in this kind of virtual environment whereby we're not in a physical environment, it kind of gives us recourse to the physical. I mean, to the physical, to the materiality, to the, the sensuousness of the material as a kind of compensatory mechanism to go and balance that out. Is, is that something that is recognized and addressed within the domain of neuroscience and what would be the response to that? I'm not really a, 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 a deep neuroscientist or profoundly acquainted with the field. Uh, so I can't say of the 35,000 people who go to the Society for Neuroscience every year, for which there are 200 special interest groups, each with 75 people in it, working on an area that's so, <laughs> so specific. Um, I can't say if anyone is uh, really uh, given much consideration to, well, neuroscientists do care about the sort of weighting of things. When this area is going to be much more prominent and uh, win out on the response. So there still is the question of, despite all this stuff going on, who gets control of what we do? Because in the, it's the end of a long chain, right? There's a lot of competing urges as to who should take control, and there has to be some adjudication of. Uh, there's only one thing you got you can do out here, so the, the, it has to find its way into the action repertoire, a selection of the action repertoire. In Sean's case, where we're talking, he's talking about a variety of underlying states that, I mean, like, even in us, blood sugar, you could have a person in two identical, the same person in identical situations, but you lower their blood sugar or you crank up their blood sugar in one case, you take them out of their normal range, and their response is going to be very different and sometimes quite volatilely different. So it happens to us all, and we'd like to think that we run through this rational system, but then there are these underlying factors. So there is plenty of work on neuroscientists interested in underlying factors that affect the ultimate choice of, a, of an action. But um, how that plays out in Damasio's theory, uh, I, I can't say uh, anything to it. And you are saying that, look, looked like a cognitive factor, the, say, the, the, the reduced the physicality of the environment or the reduced social dimensions of the environment. So that is going to like, you know, drop it down a little bit. Therefore, this other stuff is going to be valued higher. This cost structure, the benefit structure, the, you know, the, the, the way to operationalize value system over a complicated, I, I have no idea. Um. It's been a fascinating discussion. We are running out of time, so I must end it now. But I wanted to sort of just end with this comment. Um, for a long time ago, we've been talking about generative architecture, those of us in digital design. And I recall talking with Manuel de Landa about 10 years ago, and he was moving away from looking at generative uh, ideas towards the word capacity. And I think capacity is a term that I've heard many times now. And it it's a it's a kind of a term that's going to come more, up more and more the adaptivity is equated with capacity and every kind of environments or organisms have a different kind of capacity to interact with one another affordances or such and so i think it's the question of capacity that comes up into how we are going to think about how do we generate architecture or the future that embodies the the human cognition, uh, social cognition, and, and the environment, how we construct environments. So I thank you so much. This has been a fascinating question. Oh, Pierre, if you'd like to say something. Uh, did you want to say something, Pierre? No, no okay. No, I, was just, I was just nodding positively. <laughs> okay, excellent. Thank you so much. And uh, this is very fascinating. The Zoom is exciting, but we have to close up our laptops and then go back into our normal world and that's just what happens so thank you all have, have a good day great fun thank you, thank you very much